am a PhD student um, at Northeastern University, focusing on a couple of different things related to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And today I want to talk about something I find really interesting, which is hard forks, and specifically long-lasting hard forks. Um, and you may have heard of some of these, some of the big ones being uh, the Ethereum, Ethereum Classic hard fork, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold. With Zcash, there was the Classic and the weird uh, fork merge of Bitcoin Private. And so from these, you can see that these are, uh, forks are going to keep on happening, we're going to keep on seeing these. And my goal of this talk is to show um, what is happening to these systems doing a hard fork, um, hopefully convince you why they are this interesting phenomena to study, and also why they pose um, unique challenges to developers. And I'll focus on the uh, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic fork, and the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash fork during this talk. Um, so since this is a Bitcoin event, I'm just going to quickly skim through uh, the background just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so blockchain systems, we have miners make coins that keep track of who, who sends what coins to whom. Uh, that's in a public ledger. That's the blockchain. Cool. So a little bit more detail. You have the peer-to-peer -peer network. If someone wants to make a transaction, they tell their peers. Peers tell their peers. Miners hear about them, bring them together into a block and do computational hard work to try to win the right to publish that block. And then some systems like Ethereum have smart contracts, code that you publish on the block, and that the system's going to uphold. And so there's this idea that code is law. If you publish a smart contract, you publish that code, the system is going to uphold it. And now background on the Ethereum, Ethereum Classic fork um, involves a smart contract called the DAO which I'm sure many of you have heard of. It was meant to work as a crowdfunding contract for Ethereum projects. Anyone could send money to the DAO, um, and in return, they would get voting rights on how that money was going to be um, spent, on which projects that money was going to be spent. And it raised about $150 million with worth of Ether at the time, um, which was a huge crowd funding events, um, and then unfortunately some vulnerabilities were found in the code, and an attacker, if you want to call him that, managed to stiffen about um, 50, sorry, $100 million worth of Ether at the time. Some people got some of it back, but made off with about $15 million worth of Ether. Um, and so I said that there was this idea that code is law. You publish a contract, that's it, the system's going to hold it. But this theft left that idea um, People questioning whether this is how we should do this. With that much money being stolen, should we reverse those transactions, bring that money back to the DAO? And there was dispute of whether that should happen. And so some developers developed a new version of the code that undid those um, transactions. And so you have for, um, what used to be the blockchain, and then people who uh, downloaded the new version of the code that undid those transactions, and then those who kept the old code. And so this is what we call a hard fork, which means part of the network downloads one version of the protocol and part of the network keeps the other version and this, it changes, the new version changes uh, what's considered a valid block or a valid transaction, a valid message. And it's essentially a network partition. These people in these networks can still reach each other, but they're no longer accepting each other's messages as valid. Um, and so you have the Ethereum network that got split into Ethereum that downloaded the new version of the protocol and Classic that kept the old version. With this unique scenario where you have this shared history. So if anybody had money before the fork, they now have two versions of it, which they can spend independently on either chain. Um, the Bitcoin fork was a little bit different where you have the old network existing, keeping the same protocol existing as it was, and then a new protocol, Bitcoin Cash, that was introduced, which uh, one of the main things was it made block sizes bigger to handle more transactions. But again, um, right, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, but again, you have a shared history. Any money that existed before the fork, now you have two versions of it. Um, so that's all the background I have. I want to talk now about some of the things we notice in the systems level of these um, two chains at the time of the fork. So starting with Ethereum and looking at the weeks following the fork, uh, the fork happened on the 20th of July, and looking at the block difficulty, how much work um, yeah, that our miners doing to, to 
the miners need to put into the network to make a block, and difficulty adjusts so that the more miners you have, the harder it is to mine a block, so that blocks are coming out at about 14 seconds for Ethereum. Um, and here we see, so Ethereum that downloaded a new version of the code, about 90% of the computational power switched over to that, and so the difficulty remained pretty steady, while Classic, which lost 90% you know, of its computational power, dropped in difficulty drastically until it started to adjust, but it essentially reached zero in difficulty at one point. Um, and we can see that, right, so we can see that these is a really drastic change in the systems, um, or the smaller system in this case. And to see the readjustment period for the network, we look at blocks per hour, and um, we see here that for a system where blocks are coming out every 14 seconds, that readjustment period for classic, it didn't take you know, minutes to happen or hours, it took days for the system to readjust. And that can be really problematic, that's thousands of blocks. Um, and so now looking at Bitcoin, again with the block difficulty, Bitcoin Cash did something a little bit different, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, where it kept the old function, except for it introduced a, uh, in case of emergency protocol change to difficulty adjustment, the emergency difficulty adjustment, the EDA, where um, it would adjust a little bit quicker during uh, when blocks were coming out at regular times. And so we see with Bitcoin at about 2,000 or so blocks, uh, difficulty adjusts, you see those steps, and so after the fork, it kept over 90% of the computational power and it kept going as it was before, difficulty uh, growing the same, while cash, it didn't drop down to zero like, like with Ethereum, but it didn't quite stabilize until around November, they introduced another uh, difficulty adjustment function so that it could adjust quicker and eventually stabilize. So it introduced that function with another fork. Um, and we see with blocks per day here, that adjustment period for Bitcoin Cash, where it's just, it's all over the place. And uh, so here it's months where it didn't adjust. Um, and if we can, and again, until the, the, new, the new difficulty function came in. And so if we look at Ethereum and Bitcoin sort of next to each other, Bitcoin Cash was better than Ethereum Classic in that the difficulty didn't drop to zero, but then the difficulty just never adjusted until you forked again to fix up the problems. Um, and a lot of like the big, a lot of people like stop doing transactions at the time of the fork because of things like this, because the systems have to adjust, but you can't stop doing transactions for months. So, the, so developers need to find a, like a better way to um, yeah, adjust the difficulty when it comes to forks. So I wanna look at more ways that the, the forks impact miners. So here I'm gonna look at the months following the Ethereum fork and the expected hashes per US dollar. How much work is a miner expected to put into the network to get a dollar out of it? And uh, so I look at the difficulty, so I calculate this using the difficulty, the average difficulty of a block um, at any given day, the uh, average value of an ether at any given day, and also the um, average, like, the sum of the block rewards for that day. And I look at just block rewards because uh, the transaction fees are, uh, much less in the block rewards, especially during this time. And so we see that with Ethereum, that surprisingly, uh, it, the market sort of adjusted to this new fork, and at any given point, if a miner chooses Ethereum or Classic to mine, their expected payout's about the same. Where Ethereum has you know, 10 times the mining power, it's also worth about 10 times the same at any given point, even as the markets fluctuate. With Classic, we, with Bitcoin, we see something a little bit different, um, especially since at this time, cash hadn't stabilized yet, and so you see that Bitcoin remained stable, while mining cash was sort of generally not uh, worth it for the work you're putting in, but sometimes it was, sometimes it dips below Bitcoin. Um, and looking at the two here, you see sort of that difference, and you see that Bitcoin is sort of the straight line, most likely because it's been around for a lot longer, mining is done all in ASICs. The number of coming, miners coming into the network is about the same as the, the value of, of, grows at about the same rate as like, the value of the coin. Um, and another interesting thing to note here is that people didn't expect the Ethereum Classic chain to uh, survive, to keep going, and so it didn't, the market didn't give Classic a value until about four days after uh, the fork. 
uh, where it was with Bitcoin Cash. Um, it wasn't, so Classic was like the first time it was this long living fork called Cash. It was not a new thing and it was sort of a new currency coming in, in a way. And uh, the next day after the fork, the market already had value for it. Not very much value, but it already had value at that point. So the other question is if there's any other unintended side effects of forks. And for this one, I'm going to focus on Ethereum, and you'll see why at the end. Um, so one consequence of having systems that run uh, nearly identical protocols is you can have something like what's considered a syntactically valid transaction. It could be the same for both protocols. And so if uh, Alice went to send some money to Bob, she write a transaction. She wanted to send some classic ethers to Bob. She write a transaction, tell her peers. But there's nothing in the network that stops someone in Classic from broadcasting it over to Ethereum, having it propagate there, and then become part of both chains. And so even though Alice meant to just send Classic Ethers to Bob, she now has sent both versions without meaning to. Um, and so with Ethereum, we saw this happening. If you look at the percent of transactions that are rebroadcast, meaning transactions on a given chain that first appeared on the other chain, um, we see that around the time of the fork, this happened a lot, and it goes out over time, especially since uh, money that exists on both forks uh, becomes less and less over time. And we see that the majority of rebroadcasts are transactions that first appeared in Ethereum and then appeared in Classic. And also that uh, you see those two green spikes there around October and December that are uh, correlated with the DDoS attacks that were going on in Ethereum. And so these are transactions uh, tax transactions that are first taking place in Ethereum and then re being rebroadcast to Classic and also attacking Classic, which is an interesting uh, case of these two systems that are supposed to be separate but now have this attack that can hit both of the same transactions. Um, and it's important to note that these aren't all unintended uh, doubles, uh, I guess rebroadcasts. Maybe you do want to send two versions of a coin to somebody and you, you do this on purpose and it's kind of, there's no way to really tell the difference between those two. And since this, Ethereum has introduced, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic have introduced chain IDs, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, all forks now have this notion of chain IDs so that a transaction is only valid on a given chain. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different cryptocurrencies out there, as I'm sure you all know. There's lots of different uh, other use cases for blockchains. But as um, these new systems are built, or as mistakes are made, or as systems evolve to um, for, to have new functionality, forks are going to keep on happening. We're going to keep on seeing this. And so we need to better understand uh, what we need to prepare for with these forks. And so I want to end with uh, some concluding thoughts. And the first one is uh, something that I'm interested in, is if an attacker can take advantage of a fork, especially since we know the exact block time, the exact block when that fork is going to happen, can the attacker leverage that to hurt the system, most likely hurt the smaller system? Um, what are the long-term implications of having these systems that have the shared history? One thing was these transaction rebroadcasts. Are there any other risks in having two systems with a shared history? Maybe risks with smart contracts that exist in both chains. And then finally, should developers be building the systems with the expectation that we're going to keep seeing hard forks? What else do we need to account for? What lessons should we learn before we have to learn them on active systems and have to fix all these problems with more and more forks? Um, so yeah. So what I want to say, uh, most of the stuff I talked about with Ethereum was part of a previous paper. Um, so if you want to know more, you can check that out. And I can take some questions that have some extra time if anybody has them. But thank you. You, you talk about the rebroadcasting attack. You know, mm -hmm. I mean that would only happen when the transaction were done in a certain period before the fork, when both states are both uh, chains are in kind of flux. Uh, I guess if you transferred money from, I mean, rebroadcast re attacks can't really steal your money. It only give you money, replicate the money, transfer from one coin, uh, one address to other address as per one of the other chains. I believe. Yeah, but before this notion of chain IDs. The re like maybe you want to send money to somebody just in classic, and that person wants to also have your ethers. Right. And they can rebroadcast the transaction. Right? Yeah, but in the in the flux period, you know, when the fork was happening, uh, it's only you cannot rebroadcast all the transactions, and you can only rebroadcast 
some of the transaction, the flux period, because both uh, side chains, the second side chain would, would definitely take uh, evasive measure for the new transactions. But the, for the previous transactions that are already transferred, how can you retransfer what is, what is already been transferred? Well, it has only been transferred in one of the chains. So you just. The new ones have not been transferred, and the new ones, okay, all right, we'll, we'll have that. Okay. Right, yeah. So thanks much. Uh, so, like, I guess kind of like uh, in reference to the last question about building systems with the expectation that forks are, like, inevitable, like, um, like there are, I guess, like a lot of exchanges that, like, follow the whole, like, cold wallet, hot wallet, like, architecture where they kind of, like, cycle around, like, a fraction of the funds in the hot wallets, but then have, like, every, like most of the other funds for any given, like, asset on the cold wallets, like, um, what, I guess, new architectures or like suggestions would you have for exchanges or somebody who is like, say, not quite an explicit custody, uh, um, custody like service that says, hey, we're going to, you know, since we're, we have your uh, private keys ex exactly mapped to you, you'll be able to access any and all like asset, like, let's say, uh, I don't know, Kraken or any other exchange, like what, I guess, suggestion would you have for kind of changing the way that they like have assets structured so that if there is like a fork and um, I guess they want to like basically support that without having to like completely re rewrite their co code base, like how would you think that they'd be able to kind of do that? Um, yeah, that's, I'm not really sure what the suggestions to give to... I, um, I'm not really sure, I guess I'd be more, for the last point, I'm more of like how should forks be built into the systems themselves. I think that how we deal with them, has to, we have to better understand what we're expecting with forks. And so for um, cracking and whatnot to be able to deal with forks, we need to study them more and to know what to expect when they happen. For sure, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious if you have any uh, thoughts on the Monero proposed hard fork um, as re in response to Bitmain's ASICs and what kind of precedent that might set moving forward for blockchains. Um, where's the... I, I don't have any thoughts on that, I'm sorry. No. Um, are you aware Monero XMR is uh, proposing a hard fork? I am, yes. Um, and so changing the, because of the uh, new ASICs so, that were introduced, it would make mining a whole lot easier for the people with those ASICs, not the old ASICs. Um, I guess, no, I don't have any other thoughts on that fork. I haven't really looked at it in that much detail. Okay, so what, what about uh, if you had a blockchain that changed its algorithm and are forced basically forks uh, on a regular interval, do you think that if, um, would have any implications for security or otherwise? I think it would, but I think it also, if you have it in the protocol or people, um, see like with like Zcash, every time they, they force forks so that you can you would download a new protocol and to keep, tra keep up to date with like the newer versions of the code. Um, I think that when, it's, when you have some idea of how much of the network is going to keep with up with the new protocols, it makes it that like these long-term forks that aren't expected won't happen. And I think that if there's a centralized way to vote on these forks in within the blockchain, um, can keep these forks from happening more. I think that answers your question. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Luciana. Yeah. Next up, Sharon Goldberg. She's the founder and CEO of Commonwealth Crypto, also professor of computer science in Boston University.